Imagine this. You pick up a phone, dial a number, and it rings. The voice on the other end is crystal clear. But here's the twist. There's no SIM card in the phone, no airtime, no network provider, just pure, uninterrupted connection. Sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, doesn't it? But it's not. This is real, and it wasn't created in Silicon Valley or Berlin. It was invented in Africa. In a small corner of Namibia, a young inventor named Simon Petrus was quietly working on something the world didn't expect. No billion-dollar lab, no high-end research team, just a teenager with a vision, a few spare parts, and the relentless determination to make something extraordinary. His mission was clear, to change how Africa communicates, starting with the people who've always been left behind. For Simon, it wasn't just about making phone calls, it was about solving a real problem. In many rural areas across the continent, signal is unreliable or non-existent. People walk miles just to make a call or send a message. He wanted to change that, and so he built a phone that doesn't need a SIM card, doesn't rely on airtime, and still connects people, completely free of charge. This wasn't just innovation, it was rebellion, a direct challenge to a system that profits from keeping people disconnected. Simon's invention sparked curiosity, praise, and even controversy. How did he do it? Was it real? Could it scale? Could it survive the forces that often crush African innovation before it takes off? In today's video, we dive deep into the story of Simon Petrus, who he is, how he built the device, what happened after the headlines faded, and most importantly, where he is now. Because this isn't just a story about a phone, it's the story of a young African who dared to dream beyond the limits and almost changed everything. Simon Petrus shocked the world when he unveiled something that sounded impossible. A mobile phone that could make calls without a SIM card. No airtime, no credit, no monthly bills. His invention tapped into radio frequencies using a completely different method of communication than the ones we're used to. For many, this was a revolution in the making. For rural Africa, it could mean freedom from telecom monopolies. But to understand Simon's story, you have to go back. Back to when he was just a kid. Books never really captured his attention. Schoolwork wasn't his thing, either. What did spark his curiosity was something different. Broken electronics, wires, circuit boards, old gadgets. While most kids played football or video games, Simon was knee-deep in electronic scraps, trying to figure out how they worked. With limited access to resources, Simon turned to the one place that had answers, YouTube. He'd spend hours watching tutorials, dissecting how radios, phones, and even complicated devices were built. Piece by piece, he was learning the language of technology, not from a classroom, but from the internet and raw experience. Then, in 2012, something dangerous happened. Simon stumbled across a YouTube video explaining how to build a bomb and a helicopter. He was fascinated not by the destruction, but by the mechanics, the complexity, the challenge. So, he did what no one expected. He watched more videos, gathered materials, and tried to recreate them. Both. The helicopter? It almost worked. The bomb? It didn't. The experiment ended badly. The device exploded and Simon was rushed to the hospital. For most people, that would have been the end of the story. A cautionary tale. A lesson learned the hard way. But not for Simon. That failure didn't scare him away, it lit a fire inside him. A fire that would later drive him to build one of the most controversial inventions in Africa. The accident was not even enough to deter him or stop his passion. In fact, it ignited in him a strong desire to do more. Simon Petra's dream was to create an electronic device for Africa in Africa that would solve a huge challenge. So, he continued, by this time, he had gotten the attention of his science teacher in school who encouraged him to participate in the NAM Power National Schools competition. This competition is an annual competition for young innovators in Namibia. Simon agreed to participate. He quickly went to work and ended up creating a machine that doubles as a seed dryer and a cooler. It was revolutionary, and he won first position. The judges were so impressed that they thought that there was an engineer at home who was helping him. But after several inquiries, the judges found out that the only help he had was from his teachers at school. He came up with his project, Taimi Vatileni, Petrus's science teacher said. 
Petrus teacher also revealed that Petrus was just an average student, but when it came to science, he was far ahead of his peers. Now, the most interesting thing in all this was that during this period, Simon was in the process of creating a revolutionary mobile device, a mobile phone without a SIM card. After winning first place in the NomPower project in 2015, Petrus doubled his efforts to bring the mobile phone to life. Eventually, he unveiled the project in 2016. Overall, it took him two years to complete the project, but it wasn't an easy period for Petrus. He needed money to buy several materials he needed for the project. Fortunately for him, his parents supported his vision. His parents, who didn't have much, had to sacrifice about 2,000 Namibian dollars to ensure that his project would be completed successfully. It was successful and took Namibia by storm. The invention, which is made up of a radio system, is attached to a box and makes voice calls, while also doubling up as a TV, allowing the user to watch one TV channel. Petrus's invention was tested and it worked. With this device, calls can be made to anyone, anywhere, without interruptions, as long as they are made in an area with radio frequency. While the current mobile phone has advanced beyond making calls to connecting to the internet, the fact remains that Petrus mobile device can change the game for those in interior areas where connectivity is a luxury. With more financial investment, Petrus can even reinvent his device to fit modern-day needs of internet connectivity. Now, all of this happened in 2016. When Petrus unveiled his project, he was applauded and celebrated all over the country. He was even contacted by the Namibian telecommunication giant MTC, which offered to become his benefactor and offered him a scholarship. At the time, Petrus made it clear he wanted to become an electronics engineer after school. But nine years later, Petrus is still at home trying to find a job and earn money to fund his project. It would seem that the nation had forgotten about the young Namibian inventor. But what exactly happened to Petrus Simon and his invention? Well, the Namibian telecommunications company, MTC, offered Petrus a scholarship after he graduated from high school. In fact, according to Petrus, the MTC chief human capital and corporate affairs officer Tim Ikanjo presented a letter to him in which the company agreed to fund his studies towards a technology degree of his choice upon completing his high school. In 2016, Ikanjo said that MTC does not usually fund learners immediately after grade 12. However, in Petrus's case, the company was proud to make an exception and be associated with and sponsor the young man who proved to possess the ability to elevate the future of telecommunications technology to greater heights. But as we mentioned earlier, Petrus was an average student. His only interests were in science and invention. Unfortunately for him, he failed grade 12. He could not graduate from high school. As a result, MTC refused to grant him the scholarship. It's not exactly clear if he was allowed to rewrite the grade 12 exam, but what is clear is that MTC withdrew their promise to further his education. From that point, everything went sideways for the young inventor. Speaking about the situation seven years later, Petrus stated that his invention is still functional but is not allowed to operate by the Communication Regulatory Authority of Namibia because the telecommunication system does not recognize it. He said the prototype is still available and individual companies have been promising to help bring the gadget to life, but so far, no one has come on board. He narrates that some services currently provided, which are directly related to his product, see it as a massive threat to them. I am not happy with how my prototype was treated by experts. No individual company came through to take the project to the next level. I expected this project to be somewhere in the world by now. I anticipated that, by now, Namibians would be using a phone without a SIM card, he said. Petrus also added, At this point in time, I believe that if I can find a person or a company truly interested in my idea, I can take it far. During his interview, Petrus expressed frustration when discussing the national conversation around the fourth industrial revolution in Namibia. It hurt him deeply, he said, because he kept receiving promises that were never fulfilled. What's the point of me introducing ideas to the nation when nothing ever comes of it? Maybe I should just keep inventing my projects quietly, using their network, doing whatever I want on my own terms. 
because trying to do something legal and bring it to the public doesn't seem to be helping, he said. These are painful words from an inventor whose dreams have been sidelined. In response to his concerns, the Communications Regulatory Authority of Namibia, CRAN, issued a statement. CRAN CEO Emilia Ngakembua said, CRAN has not received any application for the use of radio frequency or type approval certification from Mr. Simon Petrus. He is encouraged to contact CRAN for assistance and information in this regard. When reporters met with officials from MTC, the spokesperson, John Ekongo, claimed he was unaware of any agreement between Petrus and the company regarding the project. Imagine that. See how quickly the company turned around and denied ever offering a scholarship? Why would Simon Petrus lie about something like that? It's obvious the company is the one backtracking. When asked whether he was considering leaving Namibia or Africa to pursue his inventions globally, Petrus responded with a firm sense of purpose. Since childhood, he said, his dream had always been to invent something that would stay in Africa until it was recognized worldwide. I prefer Africa. It's the best place to be, he said. So there's no point in me going elsewhere if I already have the knowledge I need to do anything here. I've seen too many African inventors disappear after they shared their ideas with the world. The little I have is what I'll use until I meet the right person who can lift me up and guide me down the right path. It's painful to say, but Petrus's situation reflects the sad reality faced by many African inventors. You see, when foreigners claim that Africans have never contributed anything to global technology, we simply shake our heads because we know the truth. It's not that Africa lacks inventors, not at all. Africa has produced countless brilliant minds. Namibia alone has seen several remarkable innovations. In 2015, a Namibian student named Gerson Mangundu developed the country's own social networking platform called Namhook. Just a year before, in 2014, another young inventor from northern Namibia, Joshua Nghamwa, built a satellite dish booster using scrap materials to improve internet connectivity for people living in rural areas where signals are weak. And Namibia is just one example. Take Congolese inventor Veroni Manku, who designed the WayC touchpad the first of its kind where the entire architecture and design were developed in Congo Brazzaville. Or consider the group of Ugandan students from Makarere University's College of Engineering, Design, Art, and Technology. They built Uganda's first electric car in just 30 months. On November 1, 2011, it was successfully test-driven at the university. While it remains a prototype, most of its components were proudly designed and assembled in Uganda. Rwanda has innovators like Clarice Iribagiza and her company Hihi he LTD, which has developed several impactful mobile phone applications. Then there's Peterson Mwangi from Kenya, who created a device that can switch a car engine on and off via an SMS command from a mobile phone. These are just a few among the many brilliant inventors Africa has produced across various fields. So why don't we hear about them the same way we hear about Western inventors? Why aren't their products and designs used across the world? Why is it so rare to find a made in Africa product being embraced on a global scale? The problem lies within the African environment and the system itself. Whether it's a lingering consequence of colonialism or something deeper, the reality is that Africa is not yet a fertile ground for inventors to thrive. The system simply isn't conducive to innovation. More often than not, African inventors are briefly celebrated, only to be forgotten within a few months. Companies, governments, and wealthy individuals, those who have the power to invest and scale these innovations, almost always look the other way. Inventors are left alone to struggle, with little to no support. And, in many cases, both the inventor and their creation slowly fade away. The truth is, invention requires funding which the inventors do not have access to. It's only with the help of wealthy individuals or companies that these inventions can become commercialized. But it's quite sad that the government is not interested in investing in science and technology. Meanwhile, every government seems to have a ministry or department dedicated to science and technology. What then is the purpose of this department if it cannot provide support for African inventors? Amos Emmanuel, 
president of Innovation Bed Africa, a group promoting technological development on the continent, says leadership has failed Africa's young inventors, whose talents he believes hold the key to the region's economic transformation. He fears Africa could lose its most promising innovators to the global north if they do not get support. There is no political will towards developing the innovative talents in Africa. This has to change for the continent to benefit from the immense talents it is blessed with, Emmanuel said. If African governments support young innovators across the continent, it will have an immediate turnaround for technology development in Africa. It will domesticate the knowledge and value of such innovation. It will improve foreign exchange for African countries. So many Western countries have built their countries on the back of technology and science. Their inventions have found their way to the shores of Africa. Everything from phones to computers and cars are made by the West. This has made their economies stronger than ours. However, instead of looking for homegrown solutions to African challenges, African leaders are for some reason hell-bent on looking outward. As one African said, Africa's key problem is in the mindset. Mwalimu Nyerere used to call this poverty of the mind, which he rightly called the worst form of poverty. Our minds are such that we expect all solutions to come from outside the continent. We are so focused on this self-inflicted state of helplessness that we don't seek and, indeed, spurn homegrown talents and solutions to our pressing needs. We need to re-engineer our thoughts. Rather than continue to look outward, it's time for Africa to look inward. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment, and subscribe to our channel.